Okay. So let's go over the, the quiz question. I want to make sure all of you know how to do this. I think most of you understood the setup. Um, before I jump into this, I want to just say a few things about the midterm coming up on October 30th, which is Monday. This is going to be take home. You do not need to come to class for a take home midterm. I've been asked that three times. So, nope. Instructions right here. I'll email the exam to you very early on Monday morning. So, before I go to bed on Sunday night. So, I'll go to bed after midnight and right before I go to bed, I'm going to get the set up. So, you'll wake up with this in your, your email box. So, you'll print out the exam and you'll take it. So, and the instructions will be at the top and it'll say, write out all the details very clearly in the space provided and I'd like you to do that. I don't need you to type it up or anything. I need you to write clearly. You can use scratch paper. I don't need to see it. So I just want to see your clear solution. So probably uh, what I'll do is I'll format it so that the space provided can hold the solution. So you'll take it just like you're going to take it in class. Um, if you want me to provide you the scratch paper on the back, I could do that, but I'll probably snip that right out. So, because it doesn't mean anything when you're taking it at home. So, all you'll need for the exam is pieces of paper, the ability to download an email, and to print something, and a writing pencil. If you would like to use your notes and stuff like that, that's fine as well. So, I want to make sure you know this stuff. So, the stuff that I put on there, I would expect that if we did the midterm again, you'd be able to do it in like 25 minutes. Something like that, up to the ability of writing time. You know, I mean, there is like just the ability to write. It takes a while. But it would be fast. So this question would have been on there. And so how much time should that have taken? It should be quick. Let's just run through. So we're just going to integrate. So I'm just going to take this thing. And I'm just going to write down the integral that it's proportional to. 0 to infinity, phi to the 1 half, e to the minus phi over 2, x minus mu squared over sigma squared. Where did my sigma squared go right here? I just tossed it. So proportionality. So I'm going to write everything up for proportionality. So now I've got the gamma e to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus p beta, d. So that's the integral that we're solving. Combine some terms, phi to the alpha plus 1 half minus 1, so I recognize that term, e to the minus p, this will look like beta plus x minus mu squared over sigma squared, dp. That's it. So, two, yeah, there's a two in there. You need that two. So, wouldn't surprise me if somebody magically lost that two. I saw a few magical math moves. I saw some interesting moves where people all of a sudden said, oh, I'm going to build in lots of extra data and do stuff with I didn't ask that question. So I don't know why we're going to make the problem harder than it needs to be. So yeah, that's true. If I have lots of data coming through this process, then I can probably use this form right here. Um, we usually use these sort of forms when we're doing give sampling and decompose t's into this sort of latent variable process. And I have a name for that in the homework just to introduce you to another name for a, basically a latent variable to induce a t. So we did come up with the exact same integrations when we were coming up with the forecasting distributions without knowing the variance, but this is the same sort of thing. So I know what this is. This looks like a gamma with two parameters that I can recognize. That's alpha tilde, that's my beta, my beta tilde. So what is this thing right here? This is gamma alpha tilde over beta tilde alpha tilde. So this thing doesn't have anything to do with any of the random variables, so it doesn't have anything to do with this x right here. So this is just a constant. That's some number. 
So this is proportional to beta tilde to the minus alpha tilde. So should be fast. You already know that's the answer you're going to get. So that's what I mean by fast is we're just filling in the steps so we can write down this thing and recognize what those terms are. If you have magic math in this one-dimensional example, when we work to the higher dimensional example, I can't wait to see your magic math. So you will need to know about linear algebra to be able to do it. And so make sure you're doing things, multiplying matrices in the right orders, making sure that everything's conformable. Otherwise, I just think, what is this that you're trying to communicate? So make sure you don't do that kind of stuff. That doesn't happen in this problem. So this just looks like beta plus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared raised to the minus alpha plus 1 half that thing. So, and that is the answer. That's correct. So now I'm going to just write this up to proportionality. I want you to just remember what this is. That's a constant. So I could divide by this constant, multiply outside beta to the minus alpha plus one half. So right here, factorization, just get rid of that thing. This is one. So that thing that we just wrote down is proportional to this. How did I get rid of the beta? I factorized it out. So which floated it down to the bottom. So this is the factorization step. Where did the beta go? Gone, up to proportionality. So I did see the mistake that people took beta and just made it one. It's not. So that's not the answer. How do you get rid of beta? You factorize it out. So now I'm left with this. Now I need to remember what a t looks like. I'm going to rewrite this just once more, 2 alpha plus 1 divided by 2. I know for this to be a t distribution, this has to be the degree of freedom. That's what we call nu. So my nu looks more like a v than your nu's that look like gammas. So I'd say a quarter of you, your nu's look like gammas. That's OK. So mine really look like v's, don't they? And this thing also has to be new. So some of you derive that alpha and beta needed to be the same as each other, and that was your answer. But that's a little bit too many degrees of freedom because I told you what I wanted the degree of freedom to be. So this specific number. So how do I pick beta so that that's new? I pick beta to be new over two. So this means that beta is equal to new over two. And this also means that alpha is equal to nu over 2. So if 2 alpha is equal to nu, you do the math. And that's all you do. And then you recognize that is a t distribution. So a few different steps to this, knowing what the integrating constant to a gamma is, recognizing the kernel of a gamma, um, recognizing what a t distribution looks like, and then being able to algebraically kind of play around with it. You're right on the homework, I had more data points in there, and I was describing something a little bit different. Ultimately, the math is the same, but for those of you that are throwing more data in, you're trying to memorize the homework problem. And so that doesn't work exactly. You need to be able to do that little mapping over to what the actual phrasing of the problem is. So I think that's okay. We, we all do that to some degree. So just do the translation as well. Don't translate my quiz question to the homework. Translate the homework question to the quiz. So anyway, I'm going to send you uh, a midterm exam. And hopefully, um, everybody gets a perfect score. I would love to see that. You are not allowed to collaborate with each other. You can't speak to each other while the exam is being taken on your honor. You will not call up anybody in the class. You won't call up your friends. You're supposed to just take it yourself. This is an exercise for yourself so that you can make sure you know all that material. So um, I'm going to say turn this in on Wednesday in class. So to make sure you are giving me hundreds, I'm going to say Wednesday in class 
I get a little bit of a treat out of it because I don't have to print them all out and do all of that. So that's what I'm going to get in return. So I like the compromise. Everybody good with the instruction set? So it's going to be about five questions, five questions, multi-part, and it's going to cover stuff that we've talked about in class. So we're a little bit behind, but we're not too far behind. I think we understand the material a little bit better than in some years where we're trying to race through everything. The good news is, is all the stuff that we're missing to be able to accomplish the homework, we already know it. You just need to be told. You kind of know it. So it's just a, a small leap. So I'm going to extend the homework until November 10th. I sent you an email on that. Um, that gives us another opportunity for a review session so we can lock all that stuff down. The only hard part of that problem is probably the rack problem that I put in there. And I'll tell you about that problem next week. Um, give you some notation. And the only hard part of that problem is being able to factorize the likelihood. And so I find that people have a hard time doing that. But if you just kind of write down what the sampling process is, how many times you touch the random effect model, that should appear as a term in your likelihood. We'll walk through that next week and I'll try to dissect that for you. You need to know what a wish art distribution is. It's a multivariate version of a inverse gamma. So that's the part that's super confusing. It's actually an inverse gamma is what it's a multivariate thing. So they're opposite of each other. So very often um, we model instead um, I'm going to ask you to do the, the way the problem is written on the, the homework, where you're going to be integrating over a, a matrix. It's written so that you need to know what an inverse wish art is. So, but I'm going to teach it through the wish art lens. So just as a heads up, as a reminder, even though we have until November 10th, the um, distribution you're going to want to look at in the book, in whatever your table reference, your reference on distributions are, so where you have all your tables of distributions and all their properties, you're going to be looking at the inverse wish art. Don't worry about that until next week. I'll tell you what a wish art is once we get through everything. So, still takes time to discuss these things, even though I don't think it's a big leap. And I think most of classes kind of like that until we get hypothesis testing. So, if I need some time, I'm going to take it out of that. So, and that's going to be my, my method for dealing with us being a little bit off track. I think that would be fun. We will cover hypothesis testing. I'm just going to save myself some of the head. Okay, let's do some MCMC real quick. We all know what the problem is that we were studying. We wrote down the full conditional distributions before, but we're going to use Metropolis steps to sample everything. Just to illustrate an idea, it'll still work, um, but I'm really intentionally slowing down my code with everything. So hopefully you've managed to struggle past the indexing on your loops and got them right. Where you start everything at zero or one kind of makes a difference. You have to stick with the right convention all the way through. Okay. I just want to show you a couple things. Also, for the, the quizzes, if you took it, you'll get 100%. So I just want the communication. I can already see half of your faces, the people that kind of made hair. So oh, thank goodness. I bet you remember this. So hopefully you will. I think that's the goal. Okay, I'll just rerun the, the Gibbs example. True sigma, true mu. X will generate that data, we'll rerun everything. this huge tail sitting over here. And that's all the burn-in period. So what we'd want to do, probably if we were running this code, is rerun it at a few different starting points and just see if it's converging to the same thing. We kind of noticed that the truth was somewhere over there, the red dot, 
and it's flanked by all these black points, which is the MCMC searcher. The goal is not to dive in on that red point exactly, it's to construct the probability distribution that explains that truth. And so sometimes in my simulations, the red dot will be right near the center of the distribution, but every once in a while it will drift out towards the boundary of the distribution. And so it'll never be way off, because the likelihood should cover the truth. It's just a question of its variability, and we're only using 15 data points here. So that's where we were last time. Everything works great. I just want to point out that if I ran this code, and I took out all this log stuff that I had built in, it won't work. So let's just do the exact same thing. So now I'm on a, um, taking some logs right here. I took these logs just to be totally ridiculous. So I guess it is on a different scale right here, and I guess I don't need to change this part of the code, and I don't need to change this part of the code. I could have taken a ratio of those two things and then taken a log of them. Won't help either. So. Let's rerun. This is the exact same code, the exact same data. Oh wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so, that's incredible that it worked. Okay, let's just do another exercise real quick. Let me crank up the data set size. This will kill it. So it might work just because there's only a few things getting producted into each other, 15 things. And so I guess that wasn't enough to perturb the numerics of everything. I thought that it would just because we were starting so far away. But I bet I could mess this up. And I think this is what probably happens with people is, boom, 100 data points, it worked in my test case, and then they jump to their real data and can't figure out why it doesn't work. Wow. <laughs> it kind of works. That's amazing. This computer is better than my old computers. Let's start it farther away. Is it using higher precision math? Uh, I mean, it's 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 doubled, so I guess that's a lot. But I'm still surprised. What's that? Thousand Yeah, that would probably do it. Let's just start farther away. Boom, and see if that will break everything. Not so good. Not so good. Not so good. I love this. That trace plus just stuck. So that's not even updating. It's not even moving around because I've got some imps or bands floating around in there. So what was happening in those squared forms when I was exponentiating them, I mean, it was making them go close to zero and then multiplying them all together. Eventually the computer just thought that's close enough to zero. I'm just going to call it zero. And once you hit that air, you can't recover from it. So that looks like it's converged. <laughs> That's the, like the strongest form of convergence, but it hasn't converged to the truth. So it hasn't converged to the answer. The answer was still the seven in the one quarter, so on the precision scale. So just keep in mind, use logarithms, write it into the correct form. So I left those into the code that I posted online just so you can toggle back and forth and see what I mean when I say work on a log scale. And you might think it's ridiculous that I did this, but I've seen these errors pop up when I tell people to work on a log scale. I took a log, it didn't help. <laughs> that error had already been made. So what I mean is I'm actually taking a log before I take this exponentiation right here. I'm factoring out everything, I'm subtracting off everything, and I can write everything a lot more clearly right here. Boom, boom. Let's see if this works. Well, probably hasn't run enough iterations. Let me see. So it's diving down. If you look at this in view, it's making some progress, but I started it up at a thousand. And so that just hasn't burned in yet. But there's some semblance of an idea that it's trying to converge, at least it's searching. So what we would have to do is probably let this run for more iterations. I 
can see it converging. I don't know if you can see the bottom of the plot. It's almost there. Boom. This is the worst figure in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the answer was here, and it ended up doing this march over there. So I'll just point out, when you're looking at this right here, this answer, you can see, and this would actually probably make you pretty happy if you're running something and you're having trouble converging, that it seems stuck right here for a long time, and then boom, it pulled in. Where did that happen? When that was about a seven. So seven times 10 to the five, if we look at the corresponding point over on this trace plot, for mu, what had happened is this is walking up the tail of the distribution, it finally started to converge, and once that converged, it had a better idea of what the variance was. And they both converged together. So the point is, is that if one parameter is converged, and the other parameter hasn't converged, and they have anything to do with each other, the whole process is not converged yet. And so anything that you're willing to report or make statements about, you need to monitor its convergence. You could automate this and try to look for when it converges, but I would say, while you're getting acquainted with MCMC, run everything and make trace plots and look at them and zoom in on them and make sure that it looks like everything is converged. Start it at different locations, stress the heck out of it, start it really far away and make sure that you're always able to come into the same point. Are you and Sigma always gonna converge almost exactly at the same time in this particular? No, I bet, it's, I bet they're like, it depends on the step size. So I bet I could set it up so that one lags in convergence by a thousand steps or something. But just once, by once one of them converges, uh, the other one will converge a lot faster than one. Probably. One it depends on what they have to do with each other. Right. So the joint will be. If it could be the case that you have two parameters that kind of pull at each other. So imagine I have two parameters and the posterior distribution looks like a boomerang or something. So maybe when this thing is high, this other thing is low. So it might be that they're converging together but kind of going back and forth and there's a periodicity to it. So you have to watch out for these things. Once you see that, that will really slow down your convergence. Then you have an idea of how to construct a joint proposal for moving around that space. And so, oh, this is a boomerang distribution or something like that. There's all kinds of funny distributions, which is hats boomerangs and there are test cases that show up in real problems that you want to test your algorithm to see if it converges on these tricky situations. So sometimes there's a tug of war and that happens when parameters have something to do with each other. So there's no simple answer to it. I need a whole class to go through MCMC methods. And basically all the methods differ by the way you structure the proposals. Some proposals have hierarchical processes, you know, so going through all of that probably takes a full semester. So this is at least your first foray into it, and I think the example that I've given you in homework is a little bit optimistic. I'm gonna give you another example um, conforming to Gelfin and Smith's original Gibbs sampling paper, and you're gonna try to code that up as well. So it's something to look forward to. And you're gonna try to replicate their numbers and their answers, and it'll be a fun exercise. Any questions about all this? Let's look at it just a little bit more. We know what converging looks like. Let's see what converged looks like. So we kind of see that if it's all of a sudden still moving and it's trending in some direction, what we're waiting for is for that thing to stabilize, and that's the stationary distribution. So let's um, bring this down a little bit so we can just kind of look at what things look like once we hit the truth. So I'm just going to start it at the truth. That's cheating. I could start it a little bit off from the truth or start it at X bar. That would be kind of fair game. That was somewhere that you might want to start your chain. So, but I'm just going to do this so we can kind of see what does converged look like. And I want to exemplify two different ideas. Okay. Here are two trace plots, I think. One second. Exactly, I was hoping that was gonna be the case. So burn it. Iterate. 
calculations. Thousand. Okay, cool. Good diagnosis. So here's a thousand points or so from the, the stationary target, our joint posterior distribution. I want to exemplify a phenomena, and they're a little bit different in these two different trace plots. So over on the left, we see that, again, there's some semblance of convergence. When I start to see this sort of stuff, I'm like, it looks like it's bouncing around some distribution and it's staying there. And it's not changing over the iteration space. It's just moving back and forth through this distribution and sampling from the same process, and that process isn't changing. So in the, as it's burning in, the process is changing. So it's not stationary. After it burns in and hits the target, it stays sampling from the same distribution. But this is snaking through everything right here. So it looks like what I probably need to do when I see that, I'm taking too small of steps over from mu. So you probably want to increase the step size. So that's your proposal. So I'm not being ambitious enough in my search. So I should probably search a little bit faster. Where this one looks a little bit different, that I have these plateaus that are forming. So the chain is sticking. So there, and it probably means that I need to tune down the step size for the variance and make that move a little bit slower because those plateaus mean that I'm trying to jump too far away from the distribution. So I'm staying at the same location. And that means that my step size is too ambitious. So let's just change that. This is why somebody doing anything to see looks like in their office. They just kind of fiddle around with these things and look at these plots and try to make them better and better. Of course you can automate this. So and people have already written those papers. So let's just go down to mu, look at my step size right here. I'm going to just multiply this by some number times 10. Maybe times 10 is good. So I don't know, I'll just increase the variance of my proposal. So let's come down here and multiply this by something that's a little bit smaller. So I'm going to say times 1 half. So I'll say divide by 2. And rerun it. And here are my two trace blocks. So if I were staring at this trace plot, for mu, I would say, well, that seems like it's sticking now a lot. So there's a lot of sticking, so I would probably go the other direction and say, well, I, I multiply by 10, maybe it should be 5. So because I want that not to stick as much. And so you're gauging these two different phenomena. I would say that's pretty good. It seems like it's bouncing around the distribution. And it seems like it stays in some area, but it travels up the tails periodically. So I can kind of see the tails form. Keep in mind, the gamma distribution is not symmetric. And so that's what we're seeing with these little whiskers popping up. I just made up that term. Don't ever use whiskers. So, but we see some semblance of convergence. I kind of like how phi is converging. And I would think that maybe mu needs to move just a little bit, um, not as ambitiously through its search. So let's go back and do it one more time. Multiply this by 5. And if you want to know what adaptive MCMC schemes do, they do this. So you could automate this. I get great pleasure out of doing it myself. So there's the posterior samples. And here's my two trace blocks. So they're getting a little bit more ironed out. So I would say that's starting to look pretty good. And if you are really particular, you might say, oh, the one on mu is still moving a little bit too fast. It's, these are these plateaus I can't live with. So keep in mind, as you start sampling more and more, so I can crank up my little iterations, you will explore that distribution. You just want to make sure that it can go in, into those fringe cases and it doesn't over jump. So I'll just make this just a little bit smaller, so maybe times 2.7. Feeling good about that. I don't know what the optimal number is. So there is an optimum because I'm using a normal to sample from a normal. 
So there actually is an answer to this, that what the actual optimal answer is. And sometimes people gauge acceptance rate. And the truth is, is that for it to be optimal in this example, the acceptance rate needs to be like 37%. Don't ask me about the assumptions in that calculation and how people come to it. But it motivates the idea that the acceptance rate shouldn't be too big or too small. If the acceptance rate is too big, you're taking too small of steps and you're snaking through the distribution. If your acceptance size is too low, that means that you're over ambitiously jumping around your distribution and you're rejecting a lot. So you're sticking too much. So it's kind of a Goldilocks sort of thing. You want it just right in that sweet spot. People will take that number, the rough 30% number, and they'll start applying it to problems where it's like, it doesn't matter. You know, and I've told people, oh, it's about 20%, and they're like, ooh, maybe it should be 30. And it's like, this has nothing to do with normality, this example. We don't know what the optimal is, but it's 20 seems to be okay in some particular problem. So that's why I don't want to say what the right answer is. Let's run it one more time. See if all of our samples glance at this. And what I like to say when I look at these things, let's crank up the number of iterations a little bit more. Ten thousand. Boom. Lots of samples now. And now these things look pretty good. Now, of course, we could zoom in and try to look for any plateaus or snaking behavior, but I would say that's pretty smooth. So what I mean by smooth is fuzzy. So, and I like to call these fuzzy caterpillars. And you can ask me about my fuzzy, fuzzy caterpillar story one of these days, but I call those fuzzy caterpillars, that is not a technical term. And if you hear anybody else around this department saying fuzzy caterpillars, and say, no, I think people say that. They used to listen to me a lot. So <laughs> it's what happened. So I wrote a book called The Worms and the Caterpillars a long time ago. Some of you know what it's about. I think they called it fuzzy caterpillars by undergrad days. Did they really? <laughs> so it's been going around. I take credit for this. So. So when the um, when the thing is moving around really too slowly and not being ambitious enough, is the problem with that that the dependence between steps is too high? Like there's too high of a dependence between one step and the last step, yeah. and you're not yes. uh, well getting into the tail. Oh, I see. So you want to monitor the auto correlation of right, the process, right. and people do that all the time too. So and that's where they all end up fitting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think that is it. It's, it's the the dependence in the Markov chain is just too great. So so sticking and snaking keeps you in the, the same place, which isn't great. So you want the chain to move freely around the target distribution. Keep in mind the rate at which you burn in and the rate at which you might want to explore your distribution maybe should be different. So people will advocate using adaptive processes for that. I just say run it a bunch of times, make sure that it's burned in, and then once you know where the target is, start your chain there. You know? And so, which is obviates a lot of math, you know, and how slow should that adaptation rate be. So I like to just start it once I feel pretty good about it. Okay, that's MCMC, so you know how to do that part of your homework, so you can at least get through that. Let me at least tell you what the Jeffries prior is. So Jeffries is a person. This is the plural of it. So if it made sense, it would be spelled like that. So I just want to point out his name is Jeffries. Not Jeffrey. So, does anybody know his first name? Oh, you just won't do it. <laughs> Harold. So, good old Harold. So, he's the pioneer of what you might call objective base. So, coming up with objective principles for establishing priors. So, he was a physicist and he was aware that operating on the wrong scale and specifying the distribution on the wrong scale 
could lead to some problems. So let me show you what a non-transform invariant prior looks like. So here's a rule. So I'm just going to establish a rule. Rule for priors. So pi beta proportional to 1. So always flat. This is Laplace's principle of indifference or insufficient reasoning. So make it flat. It feels good, seems like the right thing. When you don't know anything about a parameter, I don't know, flat. Here's the problem with this. If another scientist is thinking about this parameter, which is bad, so scientist one, I'll say, So scientist one likes talking about theta, scientist two likes talking about phi. And so they're going to follow the same rule from star, and they're going to come up with this prior right here, and they're going to say, I'm going to make it flat. And you have an obvious problem, that these two scientists disagree with each other on their prior rates on everything. So while they're following the exact same rule, if I transform this to that, it will not be that. So it's going to have the Jacobian term. So it's going to scale by the Jacobian term, and we've seen that. We've belabored this point over and over again. So this is a non-transform invariant rule. What that means is that if you apply this rule and work on different spaces, so different transforms of these their spaces, you're going to get different inferences. Now, good news is for a Bayesian, it's the likelihood's the big driver in the analysis. But if you don't have a big sample size, the prior certainly matters. So this could make a difference. This feels good. But the only time this ever works well is for location parameters. And we've kind of understood that. Laplace was very aware of how to place a prior on a scale parameter. He would do the inverse thing like we did. How did he know that? Laplace was pretty smart. You know, he, he was able to figure out some obvious things. I don't think this is a very good rule. So this is not objective. You want me to insult, you know, not being objective. <laughs> I'm not objective a lot of times, but this is just inherently not objective when you think about transformations. So there's no great reason to do this without any other reasons. Now we know that for location parameters, we probably do want to do that. So hopefully Jeffries is going to provide us with the right rule that gives us priors that align with everything that we've said so far. So here's Jeffrey's prior. This is his rule. It's, I'm going to place a prior. You're going to find it out up to proportionality. And how you're going to do it is you're going to look at the information. And you're going to raise it to the half power. So this is Fisher's information. It's the expected Fisher information. Um, a lot of times I say the Fisher info matrix. There is a high dimensional analog, and I'll show you what that is. Jeffrey's prior is the high dimensional analog. But in one dimension, let me just write down what I is, the information. So I beta, Fisher's info. Looks like this. Expected value, d, d theta, log, likelihood function, conditional on your data, and then I'm going to square this. What am I integrating over? I'm integrating over x. So I'm integrating out x. So this is a function of theta, is what's left. 
So we have to talk about this a little bit. But all I'm doing is I'm writing down the likelihood function. We become experts in that. I take a log of it, I take a derivative, and then I square that thing, and then I do a calculus problem over the top. And I get an answer. So, and it's a good answer. So in one dimensions, it's a particularly great answer. This rule is um, transformation invariant. And we'll have to prove that next week. But what it means is that if scientist one follows this rule and writes down the likelihood in terms of their parameterization, and they follow it, they'll get a, some prior distribution. If scientist two comes in, re-encodes the likelihood with this new parameterization, and then works through this calculation. So they are gonna take a derivative with that new parameterization. We'll see that in the proof when we transform back and forth, so we'll see some chain rule. Um, they're gonna come up with the same prior. What that means is that if scientist one transforms their prior, they'll get scientist two's prior. And if scientist two transforms to scientist one scale, they'll get their prior. Here, scientist one and two, when they do a calculation and they transform, they don't get each other's priors. So this prior in particular is transform invariant. I think this is the answer a lot of you would have liked to start out with. And just say, just tell me some math on how I can compute a prior. Here's the good news. This will be the same prior that we've been using all the way through class. So for mu, on a normal distribution, it's gonna be flat. For the precision, it's going to be 1 over V. If I transform to V scale, it'll be 1 over V. Those transform back and forth to each other. On sigma scale, it's 1 over sigma. So it'll give us all those hard priors. Um, it'll also give us a beta prior for the binomial problem. Do you know which beta it chooses? 1 half. 1 half. And it comes out of that. So if you want to just practice and play around. That's what I asked you to do on the homework. You've got plenty of time to do it. But I kind of like problems like this. If I see Jeffrey's prior, oh great, it's just a calculus problem. I don't have to think about anything. I just need to set it up right and do the math. And so if you want to give that a whirl before we approach this lecture on Wednesday, that'll speed us up a little bit. Otherwise, uh, I won't see you on Monday, but I'll see you on Wednesday and you'll all bring me the, the midterm. Perfect. Thank you guys.